people this morning the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 25, and we're going to read one verse, verse 14, and I'm going to teach this little verse and all the subtle nuances that are incorporated within it. Beloved, my message is entitled, God's Secret Things. God's Secret Things. Not only am I going to teach you what the scripture says, but I can say honestly that I can teach you this because of personal experience with the Lord. There's been many times over the course of my 44 years of ministry that I have counseled with people, and I don't know the hearts of men, I'm just a normal, ordinary guy. And the person would be speaking to me, and I would be asking the Lord, Father, what's really going on? And God, that quick, would drop something into my heart. And then I would challenge the person, I'd say, is this what's really happening? And they'd look at me, and they'd say, Pastor, you've been looking in our window? Have you been listening on the door? I said, no, but God has. How many times, as I've studied the scriptures over the years, where I've fasted and I've begged God for what this text really means, and all of a sudden a plethora of other scriptures that would connect with it, would bring it forth, and as you collate all the scriptures, then you see the truth on it. And God did that, not me, God did it. So what I'm going to speak to you today, beloved, is not just some nebulous theoretical thing, it's something that you can personally have in your heart and in your life. God's secret thing. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. Psalm chapter 25, and we're going to read verse 14 together. Everybody all set? All right, let's begin. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him, and He will show them His covenant. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him, and He will show them that fear Him His covenant. Our Father and our God, we praise you. We bless you, Lord God of heaven and earth. We magnify you this morning. And Father, we're asking that the Holy Spirit would show us light, shine light, Father, in the darkness of our soul and in our heart and in our mind. That light would shine, Father. And you give us these deep and penetrating insights and in what I'm speaking on today, this principle that we need to understand. Father, I pray you'd anoint this preacher with feet of clay. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen, and you may be seated. Beloved, here David boldly declares that there are some secret things that are known only to God that most of humanity are not privy to. In fact, most of the church is not privy to. Now notice in your text, the word secret, sod, means the undisclosed, the mysterious, the unknown things of God that he has purposely hidden, that he has purposely concealed that he is purposely not revealed to the hearts and minds of not only people uh, outside the church, beloved, but nominal Christians both in and out of the church. I'm saying that this means that God will not reveal these things to the unfaithful and the uncommitted Christian. And God will not reveal these things to the carnal Christian or the worldly Christian. And God will not reveal these things to the careless, the complacent, the indifferent Christian, beloved, or the backslidden Christian, or the apostate Christian. People want all of this knowledge today, and they think they can get on their cell phone and just Google it, and they'll get it. Well, there's things you'll never get on your cell phone that you can only get from God Almighty. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, to him, they're altogether unworthy. They're undeserving of such an infinite and awesome privilege, such an infinite blessing such as this, to receive his secret things. And so they do not remotely qualify to be the recipients of such hidden and such secret information of his. You see, these secret truths are divinely tucked away. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and the Bible says they're tucked away in the bosom of the Father and can never be discovered. They can never be understood by any man unless and until God himself ultimately chooses to release and reveal them to these privileged few who are really walking with God, who are really fearing God. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, these secret things are not some cryptic, and they're not some cannibalistic or esoteric teachings revealed only to the initiated in some Gnostic group. That's what the Gnostics taught. You have to be initiated, initiated into our group. Or some uh, Kabbalistic, you know, the the cabal today, all the people are flocking to the Jewish cabal because of all the esoteric teachings that are in it. 
and you will not see it through some new age uh, writings, beloved, that are circulating throughout the church today and all these cultist groups, beloved, and they claim that they have all this secret information that they gleaned the yesteryear and the same heretics are saying they're gleaning it today. No, sir. No, ma'am. Nor is it some new popular heretical book like the Sefer. Have you ever heard of that book, the Sefer? You know the word Sefer means, or Kefer, you depend on what Hebrew nuance you're using. It means book. And that book is circulating today, and they're saying this got all kinds of information in it that the Bible doesn't have, and it even contradicts the Bible. And so, beloved, it's deceiving multitudes of unsuspecting Christians today. I'm saying the secret things I'm speaking about, beloved, are the deep things of God hidden in his word, will, and ways, and divinely revealed through his covenants to his people who will seek and pursue him with all of their hearts. And boy, that is one of the keys, isn't it? How bad do you want something? I want you to think about you wanted a new car. You did everything you could to try to find it. How, where can I get the best Christ, price? Who's selling this over here? God says those who want my secret things have to put forth the same effort. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, verse 9 through 11, beloved, it says this, that I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them who love him. It says, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, even the deep things of God. For who knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. So if you want to get in touch with this information, you need to make sure you're getting hold of the Spirit of God. Would you say amen? You see, the pursuit of these higher spiritual life, beloved, it's literally the doorway into the inner chambers of God's heart and God's mind where these secret things are hidden. And that's where they are. Let no one fool you. They're not in some library somewhere. They're not in some university somewhere. They're hidden in the heart and mind of God. And so, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying God gives saints that will pursue like this the divine key that unlocks heaven's mysterious hieroglyphics, if you will, so they'll be able to unravel and unriddle and unveil his personal celestial enigmas and truths uh, that he'll bestow upon them if they'll but fear him and constantly ask for it. Come on and say amen out there. I'm saying, beloved, only people like this are allowed into the fellowship of the skies to hear the things what the Bible says, uttered by God, which have been kept secret from the foundations of the world. Isn't that what Jesus said? He was uttering things from God that had been kept secret, he said, from the foundation of the world. You see, folks, why? I want to tell you why, beloved, because no man could ever reveal them. No man could ever teach these things that Jesus brought forth. Why? Because they are only heard, they are only sensed, they are only perceived, the scripture says, deep within the spirit and cannot be fully grasped by the mortal mind of man or conveyed by man's mouth. As Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, 4, beloved, he said it was caught up into heaven. He was caught up into paradise. And this is what he said. And I heard unspeakable words that were not lawful for a man to utter. What I heard up there, I cannot convey to you. Why? Because your mortal mind would never understand it. Unless God touches you. Then you'll understand it. Would you say amen? You see, folks, these inexpressible words were the deep things of God that he, God, personally revealed to him up there in heaven, and he forbade him to speak here on earth. So what's the benefits of knowing God's secret things? Now that's a good question, isn't it? Knowing God's secret things means this, beloved, that God now knows you as his friend, amen? And wants to have close and intimate fellowship with you so he can reveal these things to you. Knowing God's secret things means that he will reveal to you these deep moral and spiritual and personal and worldly truths, beloved, that you need to know that most other people in this world do not know. He'll give you a word of knowledge. He'll give you some prophetic insight into something. Knowing God's secret truths means that he will teach you all about yourself. 
and he'll teach you your personal destiny known only to him. God has revealed to me again and again my strengths and my weaknesses, and I'm trying to work on all of them. But he's shown me, beloved, deep within the recesses of my heart that I wasn't even aware of, that he pulled the veil back, and he showed it to me, and I said, uh-huh, you're right, Lord, forgive me, help me now, so I can get some victory. Knowing God's secret things, beloved, means that he will open up the true meaning of the scriptures, the covenants to you, and that you will grow more quickly in the faith and reach spiritual maturity and adulthood and perfection before many of your equals. Beloved, imagine this. Imagine having such an anointing, such an unction by God, that you're more quickly conformed and transformed into the very image of Christ before the resurrection, before Christ comes again. Amen? This is how Paul was, beloved. All Western civilization was built on really the Pauline teachings, right, of the Scripture. Paul changed the world upside down, a little red-headed Jew. And yet God's hand was upon that man. And he's one of my heroes. In Ephesians 1, 17 and 18, Paul stated this to the church there. Listen to what he said. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you, listen, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Would you say amen? God wants to give this wisdom. He wants to give this knowledge. He wants to give this revelation. But he's particular on who he's going to give it to. I hope you can say, I want to be one of the few, Pastor Joel. You see, beloved, this speaks of God giving his true saints a deep and miraculous and mysterious, intuitive and inner revelation of himself and of his son and of his Holy Spirit and of his word, will and ways and of you yourself. You don't really know yourself, beloved, until God reveals yourself to you. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, there's three profound truths we need to know and understand about God's secret things here in this great text. The first thing I want you to see is the Lord's secret information. If you're taking notes, the Lord's secret information. Notice what he says in verse 14, the first part of it, the secret of the Lord, period. We'll stop right there. The secret of the Lord. Folks, there are many deep things of God that he has not chosen to reveal to many of his people in his church family. Now listen to me, beloved. I want you to hear this. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, the Bible says this, that the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Did you hear that? What are you saying to me, Pastor Joel? I'm saying, beloved, he's speaking about two distinct classes of information with God. First, the secret things that are concealed. Secondly, the secret things that have been revealed. Would you say amen? Now let's quickly look at the secret things that have been concealed. Beloved, those belong only to God that he has concealed. Not every saint will know these secret things, beloved. Why? Because they are truly hidden in the bosom of the Father. Tucked away inside of him, beloved. God's people do not necessarily need to know these things to be saved, but it's imperative to know them if you want to know the fullness of your salvation and the fullness of his sanctification in you. Would you say amen out there? So those are the things, the secret things that have been concealed. Secondly, beloved, the secret things that have been revealed. These are the commandments of God, the conditions of salvation revealed in the letter of God's word, will, and ways, beloved, that men must clearly know and understand and do to truly be saved and be sanctified. Now listen to me quickly. You cannot be saved on your own terms. You cannot put it off. You cannot say, I'll deal with it another day. If you die right now, you'll split hell wide open without Christ in you. I don't care how good a person you think you are. Jesus said you must be born again. You must humble yourself in God's sight. You must get saved if you ever want to grace grace the doors of God's heaven and live for eternity because you will live eternity for eternity in either heaven or hell, one or the other. And hell's so horrible that Jesus died on the cross to save us from it. 
And he spoke more on hell than any. Do you know that seven to one times Jesus spoke on hell more than any other writer? And he says it was a place of burning fire and torment that will never and ever be quenched. Imagine burning and burning and burning but never being quenched. It's a place of eternal torment. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this here, that we need to know the commandments of God, the conditions of our salvation, so we can be saved, so we can indeed be sanctified. Now, the secret things concealed are those penetrating and profound hidden insights. Now, listen to me. Found both on the line and in between the line of Holy Scripture that only the Holy Spirit can and will reveal to those who diligently pursue God to ask for it. How many times have you looked at a scripture and you said, well, I don't know what it is and just skipped over it? Let me tell you what your preacher does. Lord, I don't understand this. In fact, I've got a million questions, Lord. You know me. I, I've got to probe this till I find out. So God starts showing me what I did not see on the line. He starts showing me something that it is implying that is in between the line there that I never realized before because he starts making the verbs or the pronouns stick out to me. You see what I'm saying to you? These are the deep insights that only God, God himself can you. You can read another man's book. You can read a commentary. But, beloved, if you want to know what it really means, you need the resident teacher, the blessed illuminator, God the Holy Spirit inside of you to teach you. Would you say amen out there? Whereas, beloved, those secret things revealed are those clear truths simply found on the lines of Holy Scripture. But in regards to the secret things, God says this. We read it this morning. In Isaiah 55, 8, 9, he says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. People say to me, you know what I think? I don't care what you think about it. I want to know what God has to say on it. You shouldn't care what I think about it. We need to know what God has to say on it if it's a biblical matter. Amen? You see, folks, these are the secret things wherever God speaks of here. In other words, these are the higher, the grander, the concealed thoughts and ways that are so far above the comprehension and the capacity and the apprehension of fallen, finite, mortal mind of man that unless and until they are divinely revealed by God, man would never, ever be able to discover them himself. I'm saying that these are the unknowable things of God that only become knowable when God the Holy Spirit deals with you. Would you say amen? For example... When you read the book of Job, and I'll beloved, listen to me. Everything in the book of Job was said truly, I mean truly said, but it wasn't said truly. Now, I'm not trying to give you a riddle here. It was truly said, and the words were written down. That's exactly what they said. But not everything that Eli has built that so far in Eli who said was true, <laughs> okay? So it was truly said, but it wasn't said truly. But let me tell you a little bit about the book of Job, beloved. We find that Job's four friends, really three, but Eli who kind of tagged along, he was the young buck. Eliphaz, Eliphaz Bildad, Zophar, Elihu, trying to explain the reasons why Job was suffering. And they all thought they knew exactly why he was suffering. You see, beloved, they all claimed to know. They all claimed to understand the mind and will of God and why Job is suffering. And they accused him of everything, being the worst sinner they possibly could, putting on a facade as a righteous and a just man, helping people only for people to recognize him so he could kind of get a tap on the back. You see, beloved, they, mail, they miserably, and I mean miserably, failed to explain. Finally, God, who's listening in on everything, because God is omnipresent, he had enough of their ignorant pandering and speculations about him. So in Job chapters 38, right through to verse 41, God breaks forth and begins to challenge Job with a whole litany of rhetorical questions that exposes his total ignorance of the higher thoughts and ways of God. So God says this. He says, tell me, well, kind of like this. He says, tell me, Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Can you tell me with that, Job? Tell me, Job, where were you? When I shut up the doors of the sea so they wouldn't overrun their boundaries and flood all the world. Tell me, Job, can you tell me that? Tell me, Job, where were you when I commanded the times of the morning and the evening? And the evening and the morning were the first day. 
and the second day, and the third, and so on and so forth. God never said that about the seventh day, because it is an eternal Sabbath with God. Amen. Tell me, Job, where were you when I made the light shine out of darkness? Where were you when I created the treasures and the storehouses? He says, of snow and hail. This is what he says. He says, for the day of destruction and judgment. God really raises hail. <laughs> okay. When he judges this earth, he does it with snow, he does it with hail, he does it with the lightning, he does it with tsunamis, he does it with hurricanes, he does it with tornadoes. And that's how God operates. So tell me, Job, where were you when I made the ice and hoary frost of heaven in the face of the deep waters that freeze just like a stone? Tell me, Job, come on, Job. Tell me how you did the, all these things, if you can. Tell me, Job, come on, show me your infinite mind, if you can. Show me, Job. Come on. Uh, show me. Are your thoughts really higher than my thoughts? Are they, Job? Do you really think that? Do you think you're so spiritual, you're so knowledgeable, you're so intelligent that you three who don't know your left hand from your right hand know more than I do? You see, beloved, God must have pointed up to the heavens. And he says, I want you to look up into the nocturnal heavens, Job. Canst thou bind the cluster of Pleiades? That's the stellar constellations. God says, I can, and I did. He says, canst thou loose the bands in the belt of Orion? Canst thou bring forth Mazareth? That's all the constellations, beloved. God says, I can, and I did. He says, tell me, Job, can thou guide Octorus? That's the great bear that we see in the sky, in the heavens, in the galaxy, beloved. Can you do that, Job? I did it. It was nothing to me. In fact, Job, I know every star by its name. Do you? The awesomeness of our God. Amen. I don't, I don't even remember all my family's name. <laughs> so tell me, Job, do you have enough wisdom and power to do all of these things? And God says to Job, shall he, that is Job, that contendeth with the Almighty, instruct him? And then he says, Job, uh, he that reproveth God, let him answer. You're trying to reprove. Answer for yourself. You got a bone to pick with me, then do it. Well, the Bible says that Job was absolutely dumbfounded, and he couldn't. And then Job answered the Lord, and this is what he said. Listen. He says, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. I will repent in dust and ashes. Once have I spoken, but I will not answer thee, yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. And on and on God challenged and chided with Job and his friends because of the, they thought their puny and pathetic little minds knew all of the sacred things of God, just like a lot of people think that today. I'm so sick. You know, beloved, there's an old saying, the old time has all said it. The, 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 God works in mysterious ways, right? Well, that's the truth. There's a lot of things God does that I would never think of doing, and yet God knows exactly what needs to be done, when it needs to be done, to who it needs to be done, and He does it. But I would try to logically figure it out, like you would, you know, the calculus, we figure this out, part of the first part of it, this is what we come up with. But God doesn't work that way. What are you saying to me, Pastor? I'm saying that the secret counsels of God belong only to Him, and they don't belong to anyone else. And he alone holds all the secret information about the universe. And he alone holds all the secret information about the scriptures and the covenants. Listen to me, beloved. I have no advantage over you only in so much I would spend more time, more dedication, more devotion to reading and studying the scriptures. And if you do that, you'll surpass me. And I'm not saying this to self-deprecate myself. I'm not a smart man. But God himself reveals things. He's taking the foolish things of this world to... to uh, uh, despise, uh, what is the, confound the things that are stupid like me. <laughs> you see, beloved, I'll be stupid for Christ. I hope you say that too. And he alone holds all the secret information about history, past, present, and future. And he alone holds all the secret information, beloved, think about it. Secret uh, science and technology, we're starting to discover a little bit right now. Could you close that that door, that light there, uh, window, uh, Brother Dave, that light shining right in my eyes. And beloved, I want you to think about all of the great medical discoveries that we have. Who knows more about the body? 
Who knows more about medicine? Who knows more about healing than Yehovah Rufika, the Lord our healer? Who knows more about that than him? And he's allowed us to dip our little ladle into his huge sea of knowledge to find some medicines and technologies to help us. You know why he wants to keep us alive longer, beloved? Not only to bless us, but especially to stay longer so if we're not saved, we'll have time to get saved. I have doctor friends of mine, and they said, you know, I think God's called me to preach. I said, God has called you to be a doctor. He's called you to heal the weak and the infirm, to keep them alive so guys like me can get a hold of them and preach the gospel to them. That's a noble calling. All work is noble before God. All work is noble before God. Would you say amen out there? Beloved, God alone knows all about man's development. He knows all about your own deportment. He knows everything, ladies and gentlemen, about your deliverance in things. You may be going through a sickness. You may be going through a trial right now. And God alone knows your eternal destiny. Would you say amen? I want you to look at verse 14a again. Notice what he says, the secret of the Lord. That word sword, I told you, also means much more, beloved. There are subtle nuances to it. It means the intimate inward counsel and knowledge of God. And it means, ladies and gentlemen, (coughs) excuse me, the divine viewpoint by God. And it means the private and personal matters and information about God that have been hidden, that have been buried away in the very bosom and being of our God. Would you say amen? I'm saying to you, beloved, that no man can approach or access the Lord's private information unless and until he first meets the divine conditions that qualifies him to be a recipient of this secret information. Just like, beloved, I would not put someone in charge of an army that didn't have some type of training, wasn't a general, wasn't exposed to uh, uh, all the things about military maneuvers or ever, uh, like that. I want to make sure I can trust the person that I have in leadership with the lives of the men that are going to do the fighting. How about you? God's the same way. God's the same way. You know why? Because we can get puffed up with ourselves. Amen? You can have the highest IQ there is. That means nothing. That doesn't mean you're going to get the secret things from God. But if you're a God-fearer and you walk with your God, you get them from God. Would you say amen out there? You see, what am I saying to you, beloved? I'm saying Daniel 2.28 promises this, that there is, it, there is a God in heaven, he says, that revealeth secrets. He didn't say revealed. There's a God in heaven that what? He reveals, and he keeps on revealing, and he keeps on revealing. But to who? Who does he reveal them to? You see, beloved, God will always give them to you if you hunger and thirst for them. And God will always give them to you if you constantly and continuously ask for them. And you constantly and continuously seek for them. In Hebrews 11, verse 6, the Bible says, Without faith it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, you need to really diligently please God. You need to diligently seek God. Because if you do, then you will get these secret things, would you say amen? So that's point number one, the Lord's secret information. Secondly, I want you to see the Lord's saintly veneration. The Lord's saintly veneration. Notice what he says, the secret of the Lord belongeth unto them, he says, that fear him. Now that word fear, yara, means to greatly revere and respect God in your daily life. Do you do that? Is God always on your mind? Do you daily revere and respect this God? And beloved, it means to be deeply afraid and stand in awe of his person, of his promises, and of his power. Are you? I am. I've seen what God has done to a lot of people through my course as a Christian and the years for over four decades as a minister. And it means, beloved, to revere and fear his warnings and his threats of judgment. Is that you? In Proverbs 1, 7, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Do you fear the Lord? If you don't, you're a fool. You see, beloved, are you a fool or are you a God-fearer? What one are you? 
The Bible has much to say both about fools and God-fearing. You know, the Scripture says this, but I'm not going to give you all the text because I'll be here too long. But the Scripture says that the fear of God is to hate evil. It's to part from every vile way. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, and it tendeth to life, and it prolongeth days. I preached on it several weeks ago. And the Bible says that the fear of the Lord should move us to forsake wickedness and cause our flesh to tremble instead of trifling with things that we know we should not touch. We should tremble before the Lord. You know, in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14, King Solomon kind of sums it all up. He says this, he says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. You've got secret things you're trying to tuck away in your life? God sees them. You may think everybody forgot about it. You had gotten away with it. But your God says, I'm going to hold you accountable for it unless and until you repent of it. And beloved, let me tell you something. The law of reciprocity, sowing and reaping, is real. Now, now you hear me, beloved. I've told you before that the wheels of God's justice turn ever so slowly, but they grind ever so finely. In other words, God in His mercy many times gives us time to repent. We did something. Nobody caught us, but God did. And He said, Joel, that's wrong, or Tom, that's wrong, Derek, that's wrong. What I want you to do now is I want you to humble yourself, come before me, for, confess your sin, and forsake it. I'll give you the power now to have victory in your life. But if we don't do that, one day you're out mowing the lawn, or one day you're driving down the street and your car crashes, or one day you're in the store and you still get a heart attack, or, God has a way of catching up with us. I'm saying that he knows these secret things. Would you say amen? It's only people who fear the Lord are the recipients of God's secret things. They're the only ones who are the beneficiaries and the receivers and the heirs of God's secret things. You see, what I'm saying is his Holy Spirit whispers mysterious and hidden things into the hearts of those who are truly God-fearers. If you're a God-fearer here today, and you're having a real problem, you need to say, Lord, I need a secret thing. I need you to tell me how to get out of this fix that I'm in. And you may not get the answer while you're down on your knees, but you may be washing dishes and get the answer. You may drive into the store and get the answer. You may be going shopping and get the answer. But God will you give you that answer. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? He gives them to his God-fearers. Why? Because they are dedicated and devoted to God. Are you? He gives them to God-fearers. Why, beloved? Because they are faithful and loyal to God, and they are sold out. And they are submitted to God, and they are surrendered to God. Are you? Is that your life? And only God's committed worshipers and witnesses and workers are eligible to be the inheritors of God's secret things. Why? Because in God's eyes, beloved, they alone meet the uh, scriptural qualifications and the scriptural conditions that constitute one being a true God-fearer in his sight and worthy of his secret things. Listen to what he said in Psalm 15, 4, beloved. He says, God honoreth them that fear the Lord. Do you hear that? God honors them in all areas of their life, especially in those secret things. So, but if you fear God, beloved, you're here today, you say, Pastor Joel, I am a God-fearer. Then, beloved, you qualify to receive God's spiritual things. Would you say amen out there? Oh, hear me now, beloved. Does his omnis cause you to stand in awe of him? What do you mean omnis? His omnipotence, his omnipresence, his omniscience, beloved. Does it cause you to stand in awe of him? It does me. I know there's nothing hidden from his sight. Beloved, does... His infinite being and wisdom and knowledge cause you great wonder in your life. Does his absolute holiness and righteousness and perfections produce a deep admiration and adoration, beloved, in your heart for him? Hey, how about, does it produce, beloved, infinite love and mercy in, in you to, and de drive you and compel you to fall at the feet of Jesus and love him and worship him and want to please him and, and honor him in your life? I hope you can say amen. 
But love it does his threats of chastening. You hear what I said? Does his threats of chastening and punishment and judgment for disobedience to his word, will, and ways cause a respectful and holy dread and fear and terror in you? It should. You know, I've had people say, I've been living in sin, doing this, doing that, but I'm afraid God's going to do it. You know what, beloved? You don't fear God or nothing then. Because if you really feared God, you'd stop. Amen. <laughs> oh, beloved, listen to me, please. If so, if this is you, that you want to, uh, you're a God-fearer, beloved, then God will show you his secrets. Then God will reveal to you that which has been hidden. Then God will personally give you some of the private information that he's holding up in heaven. Then God, beloved, wants to consult with you and communicate to you the secret truths that he has heretofore kept hidden and tucked away in his bosom and being. So God favors those who fear him with secret and confidential communion and information about countless things, including your own future and your own destiny. Do you know, beloved, you may be saying to me today, if you're a young person, I really want to be a firefighter. Because I've been watching all these movies on TV. I want to be a soldier. I want to be a Marine. What you want to be is what God wants you to be. Find out what he wants you to be. Find out how he's gifted you. Because you'll never be satisfied in your life. You'll be chasing your tail like the proverbial dog. Until you find out exactly what it is that God wants for you. You see, I'm saying God knows your secret sins and faults. But he also knows your secret dreams and desires. He knows, beloved, what you want. He knows what you need. Nothing is hidden from his sight and knowledge. King Solomon said this in Proverbs 3, uh, 32. He promises the secret counsel is with the righteous. You hear that? Are you righteous? God's secret counsel is with the righteous. In other words, God confides uh, uh, them or confides in them that our fears of him, beloved, and he takes them into his sacred and his divine confidence, so to speak. So if you're a God-fearer here today, and beloved, you say, well, I, I, I don't have the education that I should have. I, I, I've not been trained as a preacher. Well, beloved, you don't have to be, because God will honor anyone who fears him. God will honor anyone who wants to submit and surrender to him. Anyone. You don't have to be a preacher. But conversely, beloved, in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, God says this to the nominal believer. And God says this to the natural man, that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can they know him, because they are spiritually discerned. And unless you're spiritual, you'll never discern them. Would you say amen? You know, people like this can never understand the mind and workings of the Lord, and people like this can never understand the manner and the sphere in which God operates. And people like this can never understand the soft and subtle nudges and the nuances of the Holy Spirit's voice when he speaks to them. Why? Because it is totally foreign to their spiritual modus operandum in their life. They don't do it. They're just satisfied to go along to get along, beloved. And so they don't get this information. People like this are spiritually imperceptive. They are unaware. And people like this, beloved, are unenlightened to the fact that there are even are such things as secret things from the Lord. Therefore, they do not even try to seek them. Is that you? Is it you? Do you try to seek, search out the secret things of God? You say, Pastor Joel, that takes time. That takes energy. That takes work. Uh-huh. And it's worth every time you spend, every moment you spend trying to do that. You can believe that. You see, beloved, God's secret things are inconceivable to them. It's like trying to describe a beautiful sunrise and sunset to a blind man. And it's like trying to describe a mysterious symphony to a deaf man. You see, the tube is playing now, and all he sees is... Or Cheryl. That's the drum. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> and you see, beloved, it's like trying to... Describe a fragrant bouquet of flowers to a man who absolutely has no sense of smell. So to get these covert and concealed secret things from God, then a man must walk with his God. I'm saying God befriends the righteous who walk with them with loving familiarity. You know, beloved, we know this to be a fact of life. 
friends, true friends, walk together. They confide in one another. Amen? But let me, let me give you a little addenda here. Sidebar. Don't ever say to your friend, I know this, but please don't say this to anybody. Okay? Promise me? Uh-huh. Then they're talking with someone that slips up. But don't say that to anybody. Next thing you know, everybody in the church knows it. I thought you said not to say it. <laughs> so there's some things you need to keep to yourself. I do that all the time. Because I know the way the rumor mill can start in a church. And then people start making all kinds of false speculations and arguments and imaginations. And beloved, the next thing you know, people are up in arms and they're mad. And they don't even know why they're mad. They're like at Ephesus. Right? They all had to be thrown into the arena and how they call the deputy there to arrest them. <laughs> but you see, beloved, they confide their secrets one to another. I'm saying that daily walking and talking with God is one of the best ways you can ever learn the intimate thoughts of his divine heart and mind. Amos 3.3 rhetorically asked this question. It says this, Can two walk together except they be agreed? And of course, the expected answer is resounding no. Of course not, they can. You don't see too many people who are enemies one with another walking hand in hand down the street. Amen? Can two walk together, he says, except they be agreed? So does your life and lips agree with God's life? More importantly, beloved, does your walk agree with him? Does it agree with his walk? That's the important thing if you're going to do any kind of measuring. Amen? Only those who walk with God, beloved, are privy to all of the secret things stored up in his heavenly treasure chest. You know, as you look at the scripture, and I'm only going to give you three examples, but there's many people the Bible says that the Holy Spirit points out that they walked with God. And we pass right over that and we ought to circle it. For example, beloved, the Bible says Enoch walked with God. You know, nobody else was walking with God, but Enoch walked with God and the Bible says, and God took him. God raptured him right off the earth. Amen? The Bible says about Noah, Noah walked with God, beloved. And consequently, he was able now to learn about the coming flood and he was able to get his uh, uh, nephew, Lot rescued from Sodom and Gomorrah, which was utterly destroyed by God because of the sexual perversion that was there. And by the way, that sexual perversion of Sodom and Gomorrah is the only thing in the Bible that ever brought down heaven's fire. And Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, so it will be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Perversion will be everywhere. We don't think much about it, beloved, but God does. You know, the Bible says Abraham walked with God. And when he did, beloved, the angel of the Lord showed him the pending destruction, right? It was going to happen. And so he rescued his, left, his, his nephew, Lot. I probably got that all mixed up, but. <laughs> what I'm saying, you got it, I, amen, brother. What I'm saying is this, beloved, hear me. That the rapture of Enoch, Noah's coming flood, and Abraham's revelation of the pending destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah were all part of some of God's secret things revealed only to those who walked with him. Amen? And consequently, they were able to be delivered because they walked with their God. Would you say amen out there? And that's why James 4, 7 says this. It says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. But you need to take the initiative. God wants to see how much you love him, not how much he loves you. He already knows that. And if you regularly do this, beloved, God's secret things will be revealed to you also. So what have we learned so far? Number one, the Lord's secret information. Number two, the Lord's saintly uh, veneration. And number three, beloved, I want to give you, lastly, the supernatural revelation. The supernatural revelation. Notice what he says in verse 14. Psalm 25, verse 14. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Oh, what a blessed promise to those who fear God. To those who keep His commandments, beloved. The word show, yada, means more than just to reveal or to disclose it to them. It literally means God will also cause them to fully know and understand His covenant. In other words, God will clearly show them the fullness of His covenant of grace and all of the blessings and all of the promises and all of the privilege, beloved, and all the responsibilities in it that you may not understand yourself, but God starts showing you that very thing. 
And God will clearly show them, beloved, the full force of the moral and spiritual truth contained in his word, will, and ways. Would you say amen? And beloved, he'll clearly show you the fullness of his deep and hidden mysteries of the mystery of redemption. Because that's what it's called, the mystery of redemption. You know, in 1 Corinthians 2, 7, Paul said this. Listen to what he said. He said, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. You see, these deep secret things hidden in the bosom of the Father cannot be learned by books and tapes. They cannot be learned by CDs. They cannot be learned by DVDs. They cannot be learned by you researching it on your computer or on your cell phone. No, beloved, in John 6, 45, Jesus said that one of the great blessings of the new covenant is that they shall all be taught of God. Amen? They shall all be taught of God. And then, beloved, he says, And everyone that hath heard and learned of the Father cometh to me, and I shall in no wise cast that person out. I won't throw him away. But you need to come and come ahead, and keep on coming, and keep on coming. You say, well, I fell, I tripped, I, I made a mistake. Get up, brush yourself off, and keep on coming ahead. You see, beloved, what I'm saying is God promises that everyone who seeks to constantly and continuously come to Him, and to constantly hear Him, and constantly learn of Him, that He will not cast Him out. Instead, He will convey the profound insights of his covenant, of his word, will, and ways to them, beloved, that are not known by doctors of theology, they're not known by professors or Bible scholars, and they're not known by teachers or ministers or pastors. But they can be known by you if you but do that. Keep coming to God. Keep coming to God. I'm hungry, Lord. I'm thirsty, Lord. I want more. I want more. I want more in my life. I'm on to say Amen. So God, God will give those who do come, learn, and keep coming, and keep learning, and keep wanting, and hungering, beloved. What he'll do, he'll give them private and personal communications from heaven about both himself and themselves. And he will give folks like this the full and free access to his secret things to divinely enlighten their minds and to illuminate their hearts so they can know and understand and receive all of the great spiritual blessings, benefits, and bounties that are in his covenant that he has appointed and ordained for them. I'm saying this, that it's a great honor to be the unworthy and undeserving recipient of God's secret things. Let me close with this. The Bible says in Amos 3, 7, Surely the Lord will do nothing except He reveal His secrets under the prophets. You know, we're all prophets in one way or another. We speak with divine inspiration. We share the gospel, right? We preach. The question is, beloved, is this something that you want? May God reveal to you some secret thing. Listen to me, beloved because I don't want to have you leave here without hearing this. God sees and knows all about you. He knows your secret flaws, faults, sins, foibles, all of that. And in spite of it, He still loves you. <laughs> you say, well, how does He know that? Because the Bible says of God that even the darkness is like light to Him. Amen? Even the darkness, He says, is like light to Him. And that's why Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of God. For God will bring every work, what? Every work into judgment, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So what are you saying to me, Pastor? I'm saying... Make being good a regular practice in your life. <laughs> and if you do that, and you say, Lord, I need some secret information. I need some real insight into this. And God will give it to you. Those are God's secret things to bestow. Let's go to the Father.